Okay. So um, I'm going to talk about biofilmocrity's soil and terror, and then move on to talk about Can You Hear the Mic Nightbird Call and a poem by uh, Renee Sutton. Family members of victims, scholars, filmmakers, and creative writers have long pointed out how, in the months and years following the bombing of Air India 182 in June 1985, a silence about this Canadian event seemed to descend on the Canadian mainstream. And given that the bombing of this flight and the massacre of all its crew and passengers represented the greatest act of terrorism in Canada's history, this is a striking and telling silence. A silence that clearly spoke loudly about Canadian assumptions regarding its immigrants, Canadian values, and the much vaunted but now clearly questionable Canadian ideal of multiculturalism. But into this silence, two years after the plane went down, Clark Lays and Bharati Mukherjee published The Sorrow and the Terror, The Haunting Legacy of the Air India Tragedy. In the late 1980s, precisely because of this silence, this was an extremely important book. Having a personal connection myself to the Air India disaster and eager for anything that would help me to make sense of it, I read it cover to cover when it first came out. Without a doubt, it led me, a young scholar at the time, towards a critical analysis of a public sphere I was only just beginning to recognize. The public sphere of a country, my country, which proclaimed itself a place accepting of all peoples, but actually harbored a subtle and highly unsettling form of racism that undermined so much of what I've been taught to value as a Canadian. The sorrow and terror, the sorrow and the terror helped me to develop and to articulate a critique that would become central to my future research and pedagogy. Significantly, its basic paradigms have also formed the bedrock on which most scholarship on the ramifications of the area of the tragedy has built itself. Lays and Mukherjee's reading of the event as unhoused, that is, as one that, for years, neither Canada nor India wanted to claim, as an intracommunal crime, which sets Sikhs against Hindus, as evidence of the failure of the Canadian policy of multicultural diversity, and as a narrative in which a model minority was damaged by another unassimilated and unassimilatable immigrant group. All of these interpretive templates are commonplace now in essays that examine policy, personal testimonies, government apologies, films, novels, dances, and poetry, that all of which try to come to terms with the historical and political forces that caused the bombing and the emotional and cultural fallout from it. The Sorrow and the Terror is a clearly a seminal book. In some ways, it can be called a founding text or group text. Astonishingly, there is very little scholarship on this text. But it's a book that's also seriously faltered, falling victim to its author's own personal prejudices, which were influential because these were tied to larger politics and because one of its authors, Mukherjee, was Indian-born herself, and in the 1980s, when the Canadian mainstream accommodated so few South Asian voices, her voice stood out as authoritative. Behind its careful and detailed research and its often eloquent expressions of a righteous rage were assumptions about which, about which communities were valuable and des so deserved sympathy, support, and admiration, and which were worthless or dangerous, and so should be jettisoned, shunned, or shamed. But in the absence of virtually any other representation of the air in the Abami, and considering the potential significance of the critique it offered, it seemed at the time that it would be counterproductive to point to its shortcomings. Why call into question a book that was launching a critique about racism in Canada that very much needed to be heard? Now, over 30 years later, an increasing volume of effective scholarship has grown up around this pivotal event in Canadian history, so it's surely time to challenge this persuasive book. Its underlining promotion of a Hindu nationalism that in 1987 was only just beginning to achieve a respectability in India, as well as globally through certain of its diasporic populations, definitely needs to be exposed and opposed. But what I plan to do in this paper is draw your attention to how the sorrow and the terror uses its nascent Hindutva principles to racialize class, ultimately indicting an entire class of people with a determination so single-minded that the argument the authors strive to make is grounded in contradictions and dark assumptions, both of which should be uncovered and analyzed. That there are alternative, less harmful, and more ethical ways to represent working class people will be apparent when I finally and very briefly look at two other texts from the Creative Archive that has arisen from the Air India disaster. Anita Rabadami's Can You Hear the Nightbird Call? and Renee Sorogini Saklikar's poem, Unauthorized Interjection from her collection, Children of Air India. Lays and Mukherjee's bias in favor of Hinduism emerges in this book cumulatively and subtly. In the way, for instance, that they suggest that India is foundationally a Hindu nation through repeated phrases, such as the one that describes the area east of Punjab as a Hindu heartland of India. In the naming of only positive things as Hindu, a Hindu stoicism, the brave and eloquent critique of a Hindu journalist. In the association of innocence with, with Hinduism, when the smart, ambitious children of Flight 182 are described as progressive in their cultural hybridity. And then the mention of a Hindu rosary of Tulsi beads seems to identify them all as Hindu, 
and in the refusal to name Hindus as in any way responsible for or as enacting a Hindu nationalism during the 1984 Delhi massacre of Sikhs. Instead, the book identifies the perpetrators of the killings <coughs> only as, quote, a goon squad of thugs and petty criminals. Towards the end of the book, the subtlety disappears and the authors openly declare their alliance with a by now untainted Hinduism, which they range against a Sikh community infected with time bombs, created by a badly thought out and short-term immigration policy. Isolating 1969 to 1973 is a time when the Canadian government experimented with near open immigration, which permitted visitors to Canada to file for immigration on arrival. The authors insist that the consequence of this policy was, quote, staggering, as thousands of uneducated, ill-equipped, and technologically unemployable young men arrived in Canadian ports as tourists and promptly applied for immigration. Later, they were allowed to bring over family members. Among these immigrants were Sikhs from the villages of Punjab. Described as pious, illiterate, feudalistic, and violence-prone, the people of this community are all condemned for being uneducated villagers. But Blaise and Mukherjee go on to specifically identify them as Jad Sikhs, all of whom are said to practice a patriarchal code of honor called Izzet, that simplistically defines, divides the world into those who agree with them and those who don't, and that attests to their own emasculation as disadvantaged men in a world that has become too complicated for them to understand or negotiate. The book contrasts the immigration misstep that brought these people to Canada and allowed them to join a longer-standing working-class Sikh community in British Columbia with a seemingly much more intelligent point system that favored education and aptitude, which the authors claim shifted the East Indian Canadian population to one that was, quote, predominantly Hindu, professional, and authority centered. Blaise and Mukherjee call this latter Hindu group a model community because it was apparently full of educated, skilled, and multilingual people who quickly established themselves in Canada in medicine and professions as bureaucrats, teachers, and entrepreneurs. Contributing to the nation in ways that the book implies the working class Sikhs of BC could never do. Finally, the book ends with a stark image of these two groups locked in a fraught oppositional relationship to one another that is likely to continue for generations. And this is a quote from the end of the book. Air India 182 was not just a jumbo jet on its way to India when tragedy struck. It was a symbol of Canadian immigration policies failed and successful. The two communities of Indian immigrants met that morning off the coast of Ireland. The financially successful and professionally assimilated Canadian suburbanites on the plane, and the unilingual desperate Canadians on the ground. Those families died for their continued attachment to India. These terrorists killed for the same reason. Families are opposed to terrorists here. Hindus to Sikhs, the successful to the failed, the urban to the rural, and the normality of middle class aspiration with working class desperation. Significantly, to maintain such a glaring difference between these groups, Blaise and Mukherjee are forced to contradict the findings of their own research. Although virtually every Khalistani extremist they interview, or whose history they recount, is described as bearing markers of middle class status, one is called a suburban professional, another is described as an executive with a multinational company, yet another would-be weekend terrorist is said to have a six-figure salary, and others who were actually arrested for their actions are referred to as successful property owners and small businessmen. In spite of all this, the authors of The Sorrow and the Terror nevertheless insist that a nameless, faceless horde of illiterate and skillless working class Sikhs are responsible for the Air India crash. And this despite the fact that the only working class Sikh whom Blaise and Mukherjee seem to have interviewed for their book, a young machinist from Toronto, is labeled moderate and is depicted as having been attacked by Khalistani extremists with field hockey sticks for daring to speak out against extremism, details which undermine the class dichotomy they stage. Clearly, such a dichotomy can only be created through recourse to massive overgeneralization. Speaking about similar kinds of overgeneralizations that Mukherjee, now an American citizen, has presented as truth in a public interview with a well-known American journalist, Jasbir K. Puar and Amit Esrai remarked that these sorts of, quote, outrageous statements would be hilarious if she were not considered such an exemplar of model minority discourses. A good deal has been written about the dangers of engaging in rhetoric, as Blaise and Mukherjee do, and insists on there being a difference between good immigrants and bad immigrants. Much of it in Canada has been in relation to the bonding of Air India and the long history of its effects. As Angela Failer has argued, this kind of discourse has been used by, for instance, the recent Harper government, to rationalize the increased surveillance of Canadian general, Canadians generally, and the criminalizing of certain groups of us as potential terrorists. Thaler, Kassabus, Maya, Seshi, Seshia, and others have all pointed out that, the, that constructing racial dichotomies, such as the one Blaise and Mukherjee and gender in the sorrow and the terror, actually works to cover over the racism in Canadian history and government policy that contributed to the bombing of Air India in the first place and the ineffective response to it in the second. These scholars have amply demonstrated the dangers of this discourse for racialized communities. 
But I'd like to suggest this discourse also deploys assumptions about class that marginalize groups, creating detrimental effects for these groups and for the nation general, generally, and normalizing class prejudices that already exist within the nation and between nations in this era of global capitalism. After all, what is it that makes model minorities models? It's their middle class status or their desire to achieve such status because of the rewards associated with it, one of which is the right to be regarded as valuable to the nation rather than as threatening to other Canadians or a drain on the public purse. The model mon minority version of social reality in Canada contains an unacknowledged understanding of Canada as essentially a middle class place. But in a capitalist economy such as ours, it's simply not possible for everyone to be middle class. Hence, not all immigrant groups have moved into the middle classes or will in the future, because the working classes are necessary for the functioning of the nation. Capitalist nations need service workers, taxi drivers, laborers, tradespeople, mechanics, nannies, etc. But though necessary, their importance to the nation is called into question by a rhetoric that celebrates by naturalizing professional ambitions, educational excellence, and elite salaries. This kind of rhetoric is undermining working class immigrants and their descendants. By not fully acknowledging class as a factor in the construction of the model minority, but instead simply assuming that readers would naturally value professionals over laborers, scientists and educators over skilled tradesmen, Mukherjee and Blaise's book contributes to an already existing uh, neoliberal capitalist discourse about class that disavows class as a category at the same time that it normalizes middle class, particularly urban middle class, social aspirations and realities. The effect of which is to render working class positioning as dangerous to the nation and the undermining of its ideals and as something you'd want to get rid of. In light of this imperative to marginalize working class racialized others, Badami's novel and Saplikar's poem seem to, seem to me to be striving after a more complicated understanding of this difficult and disturbing moment in Canadian history. Excuse me. Two of the central characters in Can You Hear the Night Recall are working class Sikhs, BBT and Nimu both of whom are products of the Punjabi villages that Blaise and Mukherjee demonize, though both also eventually become city dwellers, BBG in Vancouver and New Moulin, Delhi. We follow them through decades of their lives, which are historically bound up with the interconnected history of India and Canada, watching them make hard choices as, as a result of this history. The novel expects us to recognize BBG's egotism, but also to appreciate her compassion, her capacity for hard work, her intelligence, and her desire to atone for selfish actions that inadvertently left her sister in danger. When towards the end, after enormous suffering, BBG moves from being a denouncer to a supporter of the Khalistan movement, the novel leaves us little space to condemn her, since we've come to see her as caught in the hinges of a history that controls her far more than she can control it. Nimu, on the other hand, is, is, is entirely blameless, and entirely the victim of first the partition massacres and then of the Delhi Poland. Neither do either of their husbands fit the role that Blaise and Mukherjee carve out for working class Sikh men, that of the illiterate, unilingual, unskilled, feudalistic, and violence prone extremist. Nor does the novel's one, a sustained portrait of a Khalistani supporters confirm Blaise and Mukherjee's biases, despite the fact that this character is a young man. Instead, Can You Hear the Nightbird Call suggests that Jasbir's turn to Sikh extremism is in part the consequence of his experience of racism in Canada, as well as a number of other things. A fearless poem. Saplikar's unauthorized interjection similarly stands as a clear refusal to engage in a class and racial prejudice that could so easily be justified as a person who lost family members in the area and did crash, as the poet did. The subject of the poem, though never named, is Indrajit Raya, the only person convicted for his involvement in the mass murder of the passengers of Flight 182. This is the same poem that she read just the first bit of yesterday. So I'm going to talk about the second bit. Identified as this bomb builder boy and admitted only reluctantly into the series of fragmented memories, government documents, and dramatic dialogue that characterizes the poetry collection, which commemorates especially the children who died in the area they crashed, Rayat is imagined appropriately as a child in a Punjabi village, then a young man fishing on Vancouver Island and being caught, or sorry, being careful to make only a small fire, unlike the great and fatal fire we all know that he eventually creates, and finally as a worker. And here are some uh, lines from the end of the poem. In the woods outside Duncan, on the island named Vancouver, Swedish, Cornish, Punjabi, Chinese, First Nations, Irish, Scottish, black men work. Show us the mines, the mills, sharp the screeching lathe, sister to a cutting machine, on the green chain, men feed in timber, cedar, Douglas fir, the lifeblood, the lifeblood of the province, flowing inside a century's worth of work, mill, mine, marine, electrician shop. Because it incorporates the rural South Asian working class riot into a Canadian tradition that includes previous historical working class communities, 
Zaklikar's poem works against the marginalization implicit in the model minority discourse. Instead of disavowing him, the poet the poem posits the bond maker as part of a long line of workers whose work had worth. Rea betrays that history, the poem suggests, by participating in the murder of other Canadians and causing the enormous suffering, the horrendous grief that their loss initiates for their families and for the nation from which they and all their potential has been eradicated. Badami's novel and Saplikar's poem show us alternatives to the easy and damaging dichotomies that the sorrow and the terror constructed in 1987. Both of these texts suggest that even in relation to an event as fracturing as the area of the tragedy, there are other more effective ways to understand how class and ethnicity interact. Perhaps, too, they point us towards a conception of a multicultural national reality in which all kinds of differences are embraced. Thank you. larger cultural struggles over national collective identity. In this paper, I'll apply her contention about the politics of public memory to two interconnected texts concerning the Air India Flight 182 terrorist attack. Clark Blaise and Bharati Mukherjee's non-fictional account, Sorrow and Terror, and Mukherjee's short story, The Management of Grief. The latter is the most anthologized of all her tales. Yet Sorrow and the Terror remains out of print and largely overlooked within the British scholarship. Addressing such critical questions and gaps, I'll contend that these literary works act as mnemonic sites. They are prosthetic memorials in the sense that they record a permanent loss and make up for the absence of official North American commemoration after 1985. <coughs> Beyond their testimonial purpose, these texts stake their claim to national collective identity by responding to injunctions from grieving relatives to, quote, tell the world about the tragedy. And then quoting from the conclusion to the Sorrow of the Terror. Creating a secure literary and rhetorical space for this event and its immediate aftermath, these polysemic texts do the crucial, painful work of remembering through visual, historical, political, forensic, imaginative, exophoric, and effective means. And as protest works, they belong to Mukherjee's career-long project of writing South Asians into North America. I turn first to Sorrow and the Terror as a prosthetic memorial. Despite its status as a permanent document, its publication history and scholarly reception suggest it has not enjoyed as rich an impact as it deserves. Reacting to an ongoing ignorance of the Air India bombing. Mukherjee, in a 1999 essay, assumes that her readers don't know about it, commenting, quote, if you can find a copy of The Sorrow and the Terror, which my husband and I co-authored in 1987, you'll understand some of the urgency that has motivated both of our writings since that tragic event. Blaise and Mukherjee had already collaborated on the autobiographical uh, 1977 text Days and Nights in Calcutta, a text that's neatly divided into two halves, one by each author. By contrast, the authorial lines of Sorrow and the Terror are much more blurred. Given the wealth of academic interest Mukherjee's writing has attracted since the 1990s, this sense of not knowing which parts were written by whom, as well as the lack of reprintings it has received, may explain some of the critical neglect that still attends Sorrow and the Terror. The five-part structure of the study seems to suggest the drama in multiple acts. Its title echoes The Sorrow and the Pity, Marcel Offield's celebrated 1969 documentary about French collaboration with the Nazis. This intertextuality is in keeping with Mukherjee's tendency to take inspiration from Western and Indian filmmaking for the titles of her works. Early in Sorrow and the Terror, Blaise and Mukherjee state that, quote, Politically, the tragedy was unhoused, end quote. So their response is to house or rehouse the tragedy, namely to secure a safe, a safe space for these events, their prehistory and their immediate aftermath. 
They address a contemporaneous silence about the terrorist attack when, quote, much of the world was preoccupied with the prolonged TWA hijacking. Approaching this subject from a British standpoint, I would argue that in the national consciousness of my own country, the Air India attack was also subsequently overshadowed by the Lockerbie bombing. In Sorrow and the Terror, Blaise and Mukherjee have crafted a meticulously linear narrative out of an intricate, sometimes impenetrable context. They demonstrate a scrupulous attention to the complexities of this tragedy through a dizzying cast of characters and the sheer degree of often technical detail that they include, thus proving their authority to discuss it. Writing so soon after the tragedy, the authors can capture its visceral impact and the urgency of the recovery operation. Sorrow and the Terror is about faithful testimony to the events shortly after they happened, thereby making it a lasting part of the Air India 182 legacy. In part two, chapter four, the authors pay tribute to the immense courage, professionalism, and compassion of the Irish medical and emergency services. They note, moreover, that, quote, the grim visuals of disaster were what the hospital committee hoped to spare its regular patients. The 23 photographic images, which comprise an additional site of memory within the text, document the rawness of family members' grief and the horror of the airplane wreckage. They include two pictures of the official Irish memorial at Dunnanus Bay and the poignant effect created by family photos showing the stability and happiness of a number of Indian Canadians before their lives were turned upside down or brutally terminated. Particularly graphic and gruesome images are described rather than presented visually, with the reader forced to imagine, for instance, the horrendous corporeality of recovered bodies. Although they state that, quote, most relatives had come to Cork, who had come to Cork, would have no body to grieve over or cremate. This material privation further compels the need for prosthetic memorialisation. Why do the authors adopt this taboo-busting approach? I would contend that for political, moral and rhetorical purposes, they feel a duty to shock the reader by speaking the traumatic truth of the attack. This has to be grim reading harrowing, demanding, difficult to process, in order to make wider arguments about geopolitics, religious fanaticism, and Canadian racism, and to express a righteous rage at the evil and barbarity of such senseless killing. Rightly positing from the start that, quote, the Air India disaster was a truly national tragedy, end quote, and that Canadian racism warrants, quote, serious self-examination, unquote, this national memorial in literary form is deliberately designed to prompt difficult political and ethical questions. It reveals the author's sense of obligation to the families so horrifically affected by these events and also points to the cross-border nature of the attack. With its various references to Detroit-based victims, Sara and Matera highlights that this is a North American tragedy and that the United States too has failed in the task of public commemoration. Blaise and Mukherjee face aesthetic challenges familiar to all artists publicly remembering traumatic events. They quote Kieran Doshi, the then Indian ambassador to Ireland, as saying, quote, this was hundreds of tragedies rolled into one, end quote, and they refer to, quote, the limits of our language in confronting unsurvivable disaster. How can the authors commemorate death on this scale? Struggling to find an appropriate lexicon, they produce as comprehensive a version as possible at a time when, for many readers, this was an untold story. Hence, the level of detail and the range of techniques they bring to bear, from historical accounting to scientific reporting to extensive interviews with a range of players in the drama. This is a study written with passion and precision, courage and empathy. While its gritty details highlight the dehumanising effects of the atrocity, Sora and the Terror seeks to commemorate the exact opposite. Hence the decisive shift from forensic pathology and the recovery operation to remembering and humanising the Canadians lost in the disaster. Through sensitively written human interest stories, Blaise and Mukherjee offer each of the victim families included in the text their own separate chapter, creating miniature individualised memorials. But the wider effect of these chapters is a collective site of memory, attesting to the achievements and sheer vibrancy of those who were murdered. 
Thus, the authors honour the hard work and commitment involved for the first generation in their relocation from India to Canada. They also return time and again to a particular refrain. The special status of the young people killed on the flight, quote, a perfected version of Canada and India, end quote. The authors present this lost generation, mostly members of the Hindu community, as exceptional in their sparkling ability to combine cultures and thrive in Canada. They declare that, quote, the Air India families have generated millions of dollars in savings or in income for Canada. The children might have accomplished even more. This point is connected to a broader exceptionalism. The hitherto unique and unprecedented nature of the tragedy referred to as the bloodiest terrorist attack of the modern era. The final section of the sorrow and the terror discusses the unveiling of the Irish memorial to the tragedy one year on. It notes the individual family members present, it registers their own recording processes, and it quotes them directly so that this conclusion becomes its own commemorative site. It bears witness to those most powerfully affected by the attack and ultimately allows their voice pride of place. But the agonised words which close the text, quote, tell the world how 329 innocent lives were lost and how the rest of us are slowly dying, end quote, also resist any sense of closure in inverted commas. Mukherjee's short story, The Management of Grief, is a different kind of prosthetic memorial. Beyond its fictional status, a key distinction is that it's told throughout from the point of view of Shaila Bhav, a person directly impacted by the story's unnamed terrorist attack, rather than by investigators deeply invested in the South Asian Canadian community, yet operating at one remove. Narrated in the first person and the present tense, management of grief offers an unfolding story. Thus, it draws attention to the intensity of the present moment, as its characters seek to process, if not really manage, their grief. The story's differing pronouns, we, I, they, you, suggest moments of solidarity, engagement and disengagement, insider and outsider status. Early in the story, an Indian-Canadian man at Shaila's house complains about a US TV evangelist who seems to represent a normatively white, Christian, North American populace, either ignorant of or indifferent to the tragedy. Shaila imagines telling him, quote, we're not that important. You look at the audience and at the preacher in his blue robe with his beautiful white hair, and you know they care about nothing. Yet the story contests this perceived lack of importance by positioning community members and their grief centre stage. It's those from outside Shiloh's culture, Judith Templeton, a white provincial government representative in the story, or Mukherjee's non-South Asian leadership, who are placed in media's rays and forced to make sense of these events. Management of grief is strongly exophoric. A kind of companion text to Sorrow and the Terror, it draws to an almost startling degree on many real-life details from the non-fictional account. While not hiding the factual context of the Air India 182 attack, it's also not fully explicated either. As Judy Newman has noted, this withholding technique universalises the story's themes. It can also be compared to Mukherjee's use of circumlocution and ellipsis, whereby, rather like the problem of linguistic representation in Sorrow and Terror, certain ideas remain unspoken or may be only partially expressed. It relates furthermore to a similar strategy of non-naming in Srinivas Krishna's 1991 film Masala, reflecting, as Manjit Ryden has argued, the failure of the Canadian authorities to, quote, acknowledge the tragedy as a Canadian loss, end quote. In Management of Grief, the use of temporal and narrative breaks and the absence of specificity, alongside realism and verisimilitude, born out of the direct knowledge which shaped the sorrow and the terror, forced the informed reader to engage and imagine more fully, and while the uninitiated reader is required to go away and fill in the gaps. The story's use of real details gives it authenticity and is, of course, grounded in Blaise and Mukherjee's actual research for sorrow and the terror. This is also key to the text's work of prosthetic memorialisation that is, the production of remembrance in place of real-life Canadian and American memorials, as Mukherjee brings these events to a wider North American audience through fiction. The story has been repeatedly anthologised. 
Indeed, it appeared as recently as last year in the latest edition of the Norton Anthology of Short Fiction, along with a brief analysis of the text by Mukherjee's fellow novelist, Richard Ford. <coughs> Largely US-focused, this collection exemplifies the project of nation-building Joe Lockhart and Gillian Sandell have identified in relation to American literature anthologies. They correctly recognise that each such volume is, quote, a political and educational tool. Despite the controversies provoked by anthologies and their respective inclusions and exclusions, it's instructive to think of management of grief in light of its anthologised status and therefore the continuing testimonial and memorialising function this allows. Through the conferring of a kind of canonical status, it has reached all manner of readers. It has therefore enjoyed a different afterlife and assumed an alternative position artistically and politically from sorrow and the terror arguably forcing readers, especially US ones, to reformulate their ideas or potentially reformulate their ideas about terrorist attacks. Still fulfilling a prosthetic function in the absence of cross-border commemoration, it invites, even shames, such readers into knowing more about the Air India 182 bombing. 